Welcome to the Mexpreneurs Podcast, the podcast about the stories of Mexican tech startup founders who are building world-class, fast-growing companies and having a positive impact at a large scale. My name is Sergio Chavez. I'm a Mexican based in Germany, a tech startup founder, executive, and mentor, and your host. Today, we have Ruben Lopez with us. Ruben is founder and CEO of Nanofacil, a biotech startup based in Montreal, Canada. Nanofacil's vision is a world free of disease, a world where everyone can be healthier. To achieve these, Nanofacil helps biotechnology innovators to simplify and de-risk the development of nanomedicine therapies and validate in days, instead of weeks, the efficiency of their therapy. Since its foundation in 2023, Nanofacil has raised over 300,000 Canadian dollars for research and development and has won the backing of the government of Quebec and prestigious Canadian biotech and startup institutions such as V1 Studio and Centec. Ruben is originally from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechatronics and a master's degree in engineering sciences, which led him to work at different companies across Mexico and abroad in technical roles and learn from great leaders. He later moved to Canada to pursue a PhD in nanoparticles, where he identified the potential of these technology for the rapid development of nanomedicine therapies. These findings, plus his exposure to startup and entrepreneurial ideas, led him to later start Nanofacil. I hope you enjoy. Support for this episode comes from Skyflare, a cybersecurity company with a mission to make e-commerce safe for online shops and which currently protects dozens of Shopify-based businesses through its 360 degrees holistic protection. As an online shop owner, you know that every cent you spend in online advertisement counts, especially in Google AdWords. Therefore, keeping a tight control of your budget and the ROI are essential. Nevertheless, there are bad actors out there who can make those costs explode. Skyflare's Click Fraud Protection Solution helps you prevent and resolve those threats. At Mexpreneurs, we had the privilege to have Skyflare's founders in the podcast, including Juan Ocampo, a Mexican tech startup founder and Skyflare's chief operations officer. Visit skyflare.com slash mexpreneurs to learn more and also to get a 10% discount during your first three months of your annual subscription. Skyflare is at the moment available in Europe, Mexico, and Canada through the Shopify app store. Hello, Ruben. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sergio, for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk with you and your audience. Thank you, Ruben. It's a pleasure to have you. So, Ruben, please tell us, who is Ruben Lopez? I'm a proud Mexican, born and raised in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. And also, I'm a proud Canadian living in Montreal, Quebec. I'm passionate for solving complex problems, uh, learning, innovation, and life. Those are many different facets, Mexican, Canadian, problem solver. We can dive into each and every one of those. When you talk about problem solver or solving complex problems, what exactly do you mean by that? I love this type of problems in which you need to bring different disciplines together. For example, my passions are biology and engineering. So I love when you need to combine this knowledge that might be separated and bring it together. It's something that's very exciting. While I was doing also my bachelor's studies, I had a lot of pleasure on diving into those type of problems. At the time, I was more focused on clean tech solutions. I had the opportunity to go to the summer school in, in Germany, where you're located. And in there, we were looking for solutions based on technology for the cities in 50 years. The title was One Billion Projects That Will Solve Cities Problems in 2050 was the title of that. I like to learn also a lot. I like this sensation that you have, this emotion that you have when you first come to a new field and you know nothing. Where you are learning the lingo, where you are learning how the concept relates. So that's very exciting for me. And I can imagine through all of these experiences, plus also moving to Canada, you've experienced that process multiple times. Yes, it's a process that you have not just in your professional life, but also in your personal life. No, I think for all of us that we have moved to a different country, you basically know nothing. You don't know even where to cut your hair as you like it. It's an enriching experience when you go out of your comfort zone. And you mentioned before, so you're based in Canada, you were in Germany. So walk us, please, briefly through your background. So how did you end up from Ciudad Juarez all the way to Germany and now Canada and the major steps in between? 
It will go to the basis it was since I uh, was a kid. I remember that my parents always encouraged me to think differently, to go beyond and to take advantage of every single opportunity. I started in Ciudad Juarez. I did my bachelor in mechatronics. It's an experience that opened my eyes because I went to a summer school in Mexico City that was related with science. At the time, I was not very, like, I didn't know that much about science, but for me, it opened my eyes. And also, I had a great mentor there. We are still in contact. Just last week, he came to Canada and we were for a shot. So he was very important for me and, and probably Baris. Also, I had the opportunity to go to Germany to this summer school that was based on entrepreneurship and having new ideas. That was at the end of my studies. So I said, well, I think I need to learn much more about uh, life and engineering. So I moved to Monterey, where I study a master in electronics. All my courses were about electronics, but my research was in microfluidics. So something completely different. I moved from uh, mostly engineering to, at the time, we were creating artificial pancreas. That was quite of a project, and I was in charge of a part of that project, which we needed to dosage the insulin and the glucagon so we can control the levels of sugar. It was, I think, the first experience in which I jumped from engineering and then using engineering in something else. So that clicked something in my mind. And then after my master's, we sent a few patents. We tried to start a company there. But then I realized, I think I need more experience also in business, in going to corporate. So I moved to Mexico City. And in there, I had the opportunity to work in two companies. And in both companies, I was working with the CEOs. So I had the opportunity to see through their eyes how you manage a complete company. The second CEO was an engineering consultant firm from Germany that was moving to Mexico. We started being like just two, three people there. And by the end of my time there in this engineering consultant firm, the called P3, and I had a lot of fun with them. And always I had the opportunity to be in, in these type of jobs that you have the freedom to be. And I think that was very, I was very lucky. We went from being three people to being 100 people. And I was in charge of 38 of them. We were providing solutions to uh, one of our customers in Mexico. And talking with him also, I said, well, you know, I think I would like to go back to science. And I always uh, having the background that I wanted to create also a company based on deep science. And I said, well, I would like to go to Canada. And that's why I came to Canada in 2016. And at the time, I have this dream of creating ways of delivering different um, drugs or therapies using tiny, tiny things that are called nanoparticles. At the time, I think my understanding of how to do that was rudimentary, I would say. But I think it's like everything, no? You just jump into a new field and it's like that. And I did my PhD here. I created a few designs that allow us to encapsulate therapies into lipid nanoparticles using microfluidics. So you never know how things will connect in the future. And later on, I was a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University where I use whatever I learned before and through the support also of my uh, mentors here of how cancer disseminates inside the human body. And we use as models lipids nanoparticles. We were doing like kind of reverse engineering. So that's how I ended up here in Montreal, Canada. And since then, I have been here for eight years now, quite a while there. And why is exactly Canada, Ruben? Because you mentioned that you were back then working in Mexico for this engineering firm from Germany. But what exactly triggered your interest in Canada? There were several factors. I think Canada has a, a strong science ecosystem. But also at the same time, at that moment, there was something that is called Montreal in Vivo. It was an organization that was promoting Montreal as a bio hub for innovation. So I said, well, it would be nice to be there, study there, and also later, why not start my own company in biotech? That was one thing. The second thing was chance, because always you have your vision, but also you need to get opportunities. I met a person who became my supervisor as a researcher here in Canada, in Mexico City. They were there for a recruiting mission. So I started to talk with him and, and then we were like saying, well, I know to do this and that and I would like to uh, study drug delivery systems and learn how to make the systems and make those uh, drug delivery systems. And he said, well, why you don't come to my lab? And I said, well, that would be a great idea. At the time I was working and I was paying my uh, student loan. And I said, wait for me. I already had a plan. Wait for me. In two years, I will finish to do this and I will be there. 
And then I applied and I was accepted and, and supported and I came to Canada. So it's a little bit of chance and uh, also I think you find opportunities when you know what you're looking for. But also we always have this person, this mentor that make us dream. Also, I have a very close colleague that he lives in Vancouver. He's uh, also Mexican. He always encouraged me to go further, to go beyond what I could see in my local environment. And same thing, since then we are in communication. He's involved with uh, the things that I'm doing right now. So a little bit of chance and people who really want the best for you, I would say. I love how you mentioned that it's a combination of factors. No? But of course, chance and luck also plays a significant role in all of these big uh, life decisions. No? But now, what I also found fascinating is regarding your entrepreneurial journey, because you mentioned that you started a company in your early days in Mexico, but then you actually realized like, yeah, I probably need a little bit more experience. Like, what exactly was that initial company that you did? And also, like, I think it sounds like very mature that you actually had the humility to say, like, hey, I actually need to go and learn. <laughs> but how did that happen? When I was doing uh, the masters, we created like a design of a device, also a, as a microfluidic device. And uh, we applied for a patent. And we started the process with the incubator in my university. What I realized is that, well, I, I didn't have a uh, work experience at that time. I needed to learn much more about how science is done and how long does it really take to accomplish anything in science. And that's why I say, well, I need to go out of the real world, as they call it, get a few punches, learn from people who have a lot of experience. And again, I think this is, I applied for multiple jobs at the time in Mexico City because I'm from the north of Mexico. So I didn't know anyone in Mexico City. At the beginning, it was like kind of uh, difficult those days in which I was very far from my network trying to get into a new ecosystem. And I was extremely lucky that first job working with the CEO, learning from this. It was a great leader. This company already exited in the in New York Exchange uh, very recently. And I had the opportunity to learn how he interact with other people. He was very good at analyzing data very fast. And something also that I realized is that a lot of the people in the leadership team, or they had decades of experience or they had PhDs and MBAs. You needed to have this. And I said, well, it's very difficult that I get just 30 years of experience just right away. So I think I need to learn more about science, to learn more about how business are done. And when I got into the second company, the engineering consulting company, I learned to manage a team. So I think that's a great opportunity that also was given by this person, the CEO of the second company. He has a background as Mexican, but also German. So he has a very, I will say, unique combination. He was very effective at applying that into business. And I learned a lot also from him. So I have in this journey, great mentors, great opportunities, and a lot of support of having the space for being creative. And what happened with that first company? It's still running? Did you close it the moment that you got your first job or what exactly happened? Yeah, at the end when I realized that, I said, well, I think I'm not going to go that further uh, with the knowledge that I have. We decided just to leave it and just pursue and go for a journey that was not as short as I envisioned it at the beginning. But I think in realizing that all the knowledge and all the also connection that you need to have was a realization that allowed me to be more kind of focused on what the next steps would be. So that was very helpful for me. But let's say when ever since you decided to close the company, it seems that you already had in mind that, okay, at some point you want to start something new, but you just needed to gain more experience before doing that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I don't know how to describe this, but it's if you were inside a house and someone is knocking the door and you listen to this knocking the door and that knocking the door is actually going for entrepreneurship. And even if sometimes for some reason you go back and you need to learn more, that door is still making the sound of, hey, you have something to complete here. It's like once you go through that route, like you can never go back no? or it's difficult to really go in a different direction. We will be right back for a conversation with our guest. Support for this episode comes from Partnership Leaders, the leading community of partnership professionals and executives in SaaS and tech with over 1,500 members globally. We're living the decade of the ecosystem, and every CEO needs to become a partnership leader. Just take a look at the top companies in the world today, like Microsoft, Google, and Apple. 
They have all become platform companies, and partnership executives in IT have been the ones leading these transformations. Partnership Leaders brings these executives together and is building a playbook to enable CEOs and business leaders across industries to transform their organizations into platform companies. If you're a tech startup founder, Partnership Leaders is the place for you to learn how to leverage partnerships to take your business to the next level. I'm a member of PL and co-host of the Germany chapter and have seen firsthand the richness and value of this incredible community. Visit partnershipleaders.com to learn more and to apply to become a member. Make sure to mention in your application that Mixpreneurs referred you so you can receive a special price if your application is accepted. But actually, it's interesting because I think you were presented with great opportunities after that first business, uh, even before going to Canada, uh, working for these two great leaders that you mentioned. But at the end of the day, you decided to go to Canada, study, build your business. But why did you ultimately decide to do that and not pursue other career options? Because I would have imagined that at that point, you probably have either in Mexico or in Canada after your PhD, like so many different options outside of entrepreneurship. But why is it that at the end of the day, you decided, like, okay, I'm going to stick to entrepreneurship. I'm going to do my business. I think I liked what I was doing and I had, uh, I'm very grateful, but also I needed to improve the part of the science because our business is based on science. So I needed to go for a PhD level. I would say it's just different levels of uh, abstraction of reality. So I had the opportunity to go for a PhD and really go through the bones of how science is made. I thought at the time that coming to Canada and working on my PhD will be the way to actually understand how new knowledge is created and how to convert that new knowledge into something that is helpful for, in this case, uh, research and development and patients. That's also what when it came to that point in which I said, well, I think the business part I already went through a bit. I learned from my mentors. I think now I need to go back and complete my science background. And it seems that by that time, you already had a very well-rounded profile with science, with business. But what was ultimately that compelling event that drove you, Robin, to say like, okay, now I'm on my PhD or I'm close to finishing my PhD. Now it's the time to go and start my next venture. Again, I think it's a combination between luck and knowing what you want to do next. I had the opportunity while I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship at McGill to be exposed to a program that was called Lab to Market. In that program, basically what you do is you go out of the lab, forget about what you are doing, what solutions you are creating, and you talk to people. You ask them questions. You don't come with whatever your thing is a solution. You listen to them and you listen to them very carefully about what are the problems in the area, what are the opportunities. So I had the opportunity to talk with more than 100 people around the world in 10 different countries. I even visited Switzerland. I went to Basel, like one of the places where pharma companies were born for the first time. And that changed a lot how I thought about the work I was doing. And then when I came back and I saw this need of technology that helped RNA therapies to move faster, again, it's that door and knocking on that door that became harder and harder to ignore. I was one day, it was like 2 a.m. in the lab. I was running some samples and I say, how long is it going to take for whatever I'm doing to actually have an impact in a patient who actually make a therapy better? And when I receive as an answer that will be 20 years, 30 years, I said, no, I don't think that I'm I'm patient, but I'm not that patient. I need to do something. And that's how I realized that I needed to go out and try to bring a product that will help to accelerate next generation therapies. So that was the trigger in saying like, okay, now it's the time. But what was different between, let's say, that moment, like, okay, that's when you decided. But let's say a few years back, you said like, I'm not ready. But this time you were like, okay, now I'm ready. What was different between back then and this second time? I think you will never get ready 100%. And I think the realization also that, come on, what else can you do after this? You cannot do a, another three postdocs. <laughs> so you're not going to learn more. You can work another 20 years in companies and that's very good. You will get a lot of experience. But I came to a realization that by doing, you will learn. That was a big realization that it is not the right moment. The right moment is now. And after talking with a lot of uh, CTOs, CEOs, and researchers, I realized that you need to go for it. It's not that the stars will align. It's not like you will feel like, well, now I'm comfortable with all my skills. In this, it will be days in which you start to do something that you know, well, that you don't know anything about it. 
and then you will need to be able to execute. But uh, yeah, I realized that it's a never ending journey that I needed to start and I wouldn't have a time in which I would say I'm 100% ready. So the time for me was now. That was the conclusion of that. And of course, we're going to talk more in depth in our next conversation about your startup and all the great things that you're doing. But could you nevertheless give us just a brief teaser of what exactly is the NoFacil for our listeners? In NanoFacil, our great vision, we are working for a world where everyone could be healthier. How we do that? We help R&D companies to create next-generation therapies. Some of you might have heard about this type of therapies because we got a vaccine from them. Is the mRNA therapies, the vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. We can use now these type of therapies for gene therapies. We can use them against cancer and other metabolic diseases. The thing with these type of therapies is expensive, slow, and very expertise dependent to elaborate. So in Nanofacil, we create tools for those biotech innovators so they can accelerate their research and development, and we can have more of those therapies out there in the market and ultimately our objective is have those therapies and that patients can receive the best available treatment possible. Same thing, I think one of the resources that is the most important in life is time. And if we can give more quality time to those patients with their families, with their loved ones, that's the big win for Nanofacil. Our KPIs would be how many treatments are created with our technology. And that's the whole thing for Nanofacil. And I think it's like a full circle based on what you mentioned again about that realization that, okay, what you were doing back then before starting Nanofacil was like to have an impact, it was going to be 20, 30 years. No? So that's too long. Probably you're not going to see it in your lifetime no? or in your professional life at least. No? And I think that time component comes back once again. And Robin, I would love to switch gears in terms of Mexico. So you've been living in Canada, but what's still your connection to Mexico? go today? Well, my connection to Mexico, we, well, as a researcher, while I was doing research, we still were connected with uh, my former supervisors, like the research supervisors, both the one that met in that summer of 2010 when I first was exposed to research, and also with my former uh, fellow researchers at the Tech de Monterrey, Campus Monterrey. So during my postdoctoral fellowship, we were able to bring some of those students to do research with me. So that was, I think, very rewarding experience. It's just incredible what we can do also as Mexicans abroad, because once people have the taste of how it is to work with Mexicans, they oftentimes they want more Mexicans to come. So you can like kind of open doors for other people. And that was a rewarding experience. Now as an Anofacil, it's something that, we are working on how we can collaborate, may bring this technology to the labs where I started long time ago. And our main objective is to democratize also the research and development. So we would like to bring back this technology to Mexico in the labs at where I started and do projects together. There's definitely a lot of collaboration. And I would imagine, because you were also based in different parts of Mexico. You were in Monterrey, you were in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico City. So I can imagine that you have also a, a wide network that you've built through the years as well. Yeah, I think it's fundamental because there were people supporting you along the way that I think it's a good time for giving back a lot of that support. And at the same time, it's always like multiplies its synergy. I mean, if you bring someone here to do research and development, then when they go back, there's a publication that between a Mexican institution and a Canadian institution, so that it helps a lot. And now with the NanoFacil, I would like to extend that to, well, we have a product in Canada that can help to accelerate research and development there and generate therapies there in Mexico. That would be like a dream come true for me. And also a big impact no? in terms of also the progress of research, science, therapies. It's incredible. And actually, I would imagine that this is also relevant not only for Mexico, but also for many other countries as well. Yes, that's very important because these RNA therapies that are like similar to the ones that we got the vaccine, they have a great potential of addressing several diseases. The thing is that if you want to really make this new technology available to everyone, you need to allow them to have that technology to research in what is the most important diseases that they want to treat. Uh, I would like to explain, for example, Canada and Canadian, we have certain diseases that are priority for us, but that doesn't mean that it's the same priority in Mexico, in Brazil, in China. So as a technology enabler, you need to provide with the tools so they can decide which therapies they pursue. 
you know, it's you reduce the barrier so more people can do their own research based on their own priorities. And in a sense, also having like a more democratized way of spreading technology and knowledge. That sounds incredible. I'm really looking forward to our next conversation to learn more also about that international reach, because as you mentioned, it, like the context, the priorities in every place in every country are different, but, but you're basically creating that enabler that could allow them to pursue those different priorities in a much faster, efficient way as what they have today. That's incredible. Ruben, we're reaching the end of our conversation. And what I would love is to just wrap it up by asking you for your best advice for aspiring founders. Others that are listening to us that would love to follow a similar path to yours will be your best advice for them. I would say that keep dreaming and dream big. There is always uh, new barriers to cross. The thing that I think is essential is building genuine connections and relationship is essential. You can fake it. You, you cannot fake it. I have learned to listen to people. It's not just about the business and organizations. Those things can change very rapidly. And the most important part is to understand where, where the people stand, where the priorities, how they are in life. And I, what I have found is when you care, people care back. And it's about creating a circle also of people who would like you to have success and you want that people will also have success. And you define success as whatever you want, but people who care. That includes your friends, your colleagues, but also it goes for customers, partners, suppliers, employees. So genuine connections matter a lot. Because at the end, you want to enjoy your close circle. You are going to be working in this for like 60, 70, 80 hours per day. You want to do it in a context, in an environment that you enjoy it. And you, how you enjoy it? By bringing the people that you enjoy to work with. I think it's not where you want to go or how you want to be there, but it's very important with whom you share the path to reach wherever you want to go. So that's my two cents on that. Ruben, thank you very much for that. I love those golden nuggets that you share with us today. And of course, I'm very much looking forward to our next conversation and to dive deeper into Nanofacil and the great work that you and your team are doing. I will be happy and also thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to share a little bit here with you and looking forward for the next one. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ruben. Thank you, Sergio. And thanks to you for joining us today. Please remember to subscribe via your favorite podcast app to be notified about new episodes and share with us your feedback. We would love to hear from you. Thank you also to the Maxpreneurs team, Valeria Morel, Hector Barragan from Hypervoltage, Francisco Jaimes, Pamela Elizalde, Katia Cruz, Rocio Marroquín. I am Sergio Chavez. See you next time.